Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm going to kick off a short series on routing slips with this episode. And I've had a demo showing how to do routing slips that's been around for a few years, but it was a little old and a little dated. So I've, I've freshened it up. I've moved it up to .NET 7. I'm using the latest mass transit. I'm using RabbitMQ. I'm using uh, Azure SQL in a container. And I want to kind of walk you through it and get you to understand at least conceptually how a routing slip should work. So one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring up the code here. Um, but I'm also going to bring up Postman and kind of show what I'm going to be doing. So what this project does is it handles registration for race events. So anybody who knows me knows I, I'm into bicycling. I used to race, but I don't really race now. But I still have a good affiliation with USA Cycling. And I built this as a demo years ago of like how to show race registration, credit card payment validation, and compensations when those payments are unsuccessful. So well, why would we use a routing slip pattern? Routing slips are a form of saga they consist of a series of activities that execute in order. And if all of the activities are successful, everything is great. The, the entire operation completes. Think of it as a distributed transaction. All of these activities execute. If everything executes perfectly, the execution completes and life goes on happy. If, however, one of those activities fails, Mass Transit's routing slip implementation is going to compensate any previously executed activities that saved information as part of that processing. So what I have is I have a little demo and I think I have a, uh, a slide from the original deck on it. And what our workflow looks like for an event registration is we have an API controller, we're gonna register. It's gonna process that registration, produce an event that gets stored into a state machine. And then it's going to actually generate a routing slip that's gonna validate the member's license if they have one. It's going to register for them for the event. And it's gonna go ahead and process that payment. And those three different activities are gonna execute in order. Now, with the test API, I have the ability to inject like a bad credit card number or a bad license number into that event so that I can see those compensating behaviors and how that routing slip behaves. Uh, so I'm going to go through and kind of show just a quick demo first with Postman. So I have the thing here. I used a Postman's import capability to import the API using the Swagger endpoint that's created in the sample. And for now, I've just got some garbage in here. I'm going to generate the submission ID, a bunch of garbage data. I put some silly card number in there that's not even valid, but it doesn't matter. And I'm going to hit send. And we can see that that comes right back with a 200 OK, which is really surprising because I expected a 202, but that's all right. I must not have changed that. Um, and it gives me this status endpoint back that I can then use as part of that response to go ahead and get the status of that event. And as we can see, I'm actually registered. It has my ID. It has you know, some of the same stuff that I passed it. Everything went perfect. If I look at the code, I can actually see in the log, starting at uh, just a second ago, that I received the registration. The registration was accepted. We went into processing. We processed the registration. The verify license activity ran where it verified the license. We registered for the event. That's the registration activity. We, we marked that registration. You can see it has a unique ID here. You can see we have a processing payment and, oh wait, no, I'm way down here. Yeah, registration received, processing, verifying license, registering for event, registering, process payment, everything was fine. Registered, you can see 44 there. If I go back here to Postman, I can see that I was 44 and everything was good in my log. So that was an example of a working example. Now let's see what happens when we make it break. Uh, I'm going to set my license number to a predefined number, 8675309, and I'm going to run this. Now I get that same URL back, and if I go and click on that, I can actually see that I have a suspended. And that registration was suspended due to some sort of problem. In the log, I can actually see that 
I produced an invalid license for that activity, saying that license number is invalid. Since I supplied a license number and it was invalid, it faulted the routing slip and returned back that state. Now let's say I can go ahead and, so that's one example of failure. Uh, another example of failure is if I have a bogus credit card number. So in this, in the, in the first case, the first activity was validating the license number. It wasn't actually committing any information as part of that transaction. And because of that, the routing slip just faulted. There was nothing to compensate. It was updated, state is done. Now my license number is gonna be valid, but my card number is going to be invalid. And so we'll see how that behaves differently when we look at that in here. So I've submitted that. I go out and I try to get that status and I can see that it went straight to that suspended state. And if I look in the log, I can see that I received the registration, I accepted it, I start processing it, I verify the license, it's correct, I register for the event. You can see that I registered for the event and this GUID is the registration number from the registration service that says, okay, you are registered for this event. I then go to process the payment, but the payment fails. And when the payment fails, it throws an exception that event registration activity, which recorded that compensation data, then compensates by removing my registration from the event using that same GUID that I used to register it, and then the fault proceeds and it updates. So those are the three different cases that this example goes through. And what I'm gonna show you now is kind of how that code is implemented. So the first thing we have in the registration controller is a post where I get that registration detail. I then just publish a submit registration message. And that message is actually consumed by the submit registration consumer. So what that is going to do is it's going to validate the registration, which just checks to make sure everything is there. And then it just calls publish with registration received. Registration received is then handled by the registration state machine in which case I can see that when an event registration is received, I'm going to initialize the saga, which is me just copying off a bunch of data. So this is immediately going into a state machine to manage the execution of this transaction. The state machine is going to keep track of everything that happens. I capture off some data. I publish the process registration message, which then gets handled by the process registration consumer. Now this is a separate consumer, it's on a separate endpoint, but this is where we're gonna build the routing slip. And when we're gonna build the routing slip, we can see that I'm adding activities depending upon the data that's in the routing slip. So if a license number was specified, I'm, go I'm going to add an activity to a routing slip builder that we created. And the GUID that we pass to this should be a unique tracking number. This is like your FedEx tracking number. It's gonna keep track of that routing slip. I'm then gonna call add activity. I give it some arbitrary name. I get the activity address for the license verification activity, which if we look at that, it's just using the endpoint name forder formatter from the container to get the execute activity endpoint and just dropping exchange in front of that to get that short Q name. I'm then cramming some data in there, the license number, category, whatever. And then I'm adding a subscription back to the source address of the message I just got, which is my short way of saying, this needs to go back to the state machine. That if that, if that fails, I wanna send the registration license verification message back to that state machine. So this just adds a subscription for an activity fault to update the state machine if that fails. Uh, I also have an add activity of event registration. This is going to the event registration activity with all the required details. And then my payment info service is actually, and the this is another reason the consumer is doing this. When we're dealing with payment info, we typically want to use like a vault. And I don't know why I passed the credit card number. It's kind of funny. But the vault is going to be used. The card number technically is an alias for an actual credit card, so like a token ID. But anyway, the consumer is just using this service as it builds the routing slip to get the data to pass to the activity so the activity doesn't have a dependency on our credit card vault. Um, it's then gonna call add activity for process payment. It's gonna add that payment info as a set of arguments that will be passed into that type. Um, 
Subscriptions are added for registration payment failed and registration completed. We build the routing slip and then it calls execute, which just sends the routing slip to that first activity on the list, which is either the license verification activity or the event registration activity. So that's kind of a quick blast of like who, how the routing slip is built. Let's look at the event registration activity because that was the one that had the compensation. So the event registration activity, it implements iActivity and it takes in two interfaces, the arguments, which right now it really doesn't use very many of them. And it also has a log, which is going to track the registration ID and the participant email address. So with an activity, two methods are required, the execute method and the compensate method. The execute method just writes out that we're registering for the event, it just makes up some number, does a little delay, sets an ID, and then says, okay, we completed. And it passes that log type, which is down here that I implement. I could change this to a record, I just didn't for this case. I'll probably update that later. Uh, it stores that log with that registration ID and the participant email address. The compensate method gets that log as an input and can be used to remove that registration for that saved data. So this would be like if you were talking to an external service and it gave you back a, a authorization number or a registration code or a confirmation number, you would store that in the log so that you could roll that back, basically freeing up that slot in whatever resource you've allocated in the remote system. So that's how that goes. That's an activity that actually compensates. One of the other activities we have in here is like the license verification activity, which as I pointed out, it doesn't save anything. It's execute only, so it's an execute activity. And it just verifies the license. Here's that hard-coded check to see if it's invalid. Otherwise, it just sets an expiration date and returns completed with variables, adding that license expiration date to the routing slip variable collection, which is how we would pass information down to subsequent activities. Um, so the event registration arguments, it gets that stuff. The process payment activity takes that card number. Here's our invalid card number, processes it, gets an authorization code, and stores that in the compensation log. Now, because this is the last activity in the routing slip, it'll never really be compensated because it either succeeds or fails. And it's important in pointing out that if this execute fails, this compensate is not called. Compensate is only called for previously completed activities. So any, any handling should be handled in that. The arguments for the process payment is just that card data that would be in there, which I'm not currently using. Um, so this is all wired together in a service. The service is just a simple program, CS, with, I'm adding the consumers, activities, and Saga state machines all from that namespace. I'm using Entity Framework as the Saga repository. I have my DB context, which I get from here. I apply the migrations here. I did apply the migrations externally. Uh, I set the Entity Framework Saga repository provider so that any sagas that come up will just use that DB context and that Entity Framework Saga repository as their provider. Um, and then I just use RabbitMQ and configure endpoints. It's just using the default host settings, local host, all of those built-in values. So that's the solution as it stands today. I'm gonna go into a little more detail in a subsequent episode to kind of show how some of these things work and kind of trace through some of these features. But I wanted to kick this off and just kind of refresh this demo and also give people some things to think about as far as how routing slips work. So thanks for joining. We'll get you some more info on the next one.